Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about sampling distributions. This video exists in a uh, quite long playlist all about doing statistical inference. We are just about to move on to doing non-Bayesian inference, where the sampling distribution is used extensively to construct confidence intervals and p-values. Down below, there's a link to a PDF version of these slides. All right, so a sampling distribution is of a statistic is the distribution of that statistic over different realizations of the data. So what you want to be thinking about here is having a sample of data, collecting is calculating a statistic, and then repeating that process over and over and over again, and then looking at what the distribution of that statistic is. Now, we could do this with any statistic. We could take a mean or median. We could take a minimum or maximum. We could take an interquartile range, or we could take different quartiles. Um, but for our purposes of what we need to construct so the basic uh, confidence intervals and p-values for normal models for data and binomial models, we're really going to want to focus in on a couple of very specific statistics. So the first one is if you have normal data, we're going to talk about what the sampling distribution of the average of that normal data is. We're also going to talk about what the sampling distribution of this statistic is. If you take the average, you subtract off the mean, you divide by the sample standard deviation over the square root of the sample size, what that statistic has for its sampling distribution. The other model we'll talk about is a normal model with an unknown probability of success theta. And we're going to be calculating the sample proportion, that is the proportion of successes in the sample calculated via y over n. At this point, you should absolutely be able, especially if you follow along the playlist, you should absolutely be able to stop the video and determine what these distributions are. Okay, but if you can't, we'll move forward and talk about them. All right, so let's talk first about the normal model. We're going to have independent observations with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared. We've shown in a previous video that this actually has a normal, sorry, that the average has a normal distribution with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared divided by n. Uh, so here is depicted uh, four different realizations of those sampling distributions. We have in the histograms are a thousand realizations from each of the models. So the models differ in the different facets by the sample size ranging in value from 20 to 30. Uh, I guess all four of them are different sample sizes ranging in values from 20 to 50. Overlaid on top of the histogram is the true sampling distribution as calculated right up here. Right? So that, that density curve is just the density of that particular normal overlaid on top of the histogram. And what we can see is that generally those histograms look similar to those sampling distributions that we can calculate analytically. Now, uh, they don't look perfect right? because we're only taking a sample of data in this case, a thousand realizations, but if we took more and more realizations, we would get closer and closer to that true sampling distribution. All right, so now if we turn around and we calculate this statistic, this y bar minus mu divided by the sample standard deviation over the square root of the sample size, uh, I'm giving you a hint here of what distribution that quantity has. But if you haven't seen it before, you should probably go back and watch the video all about the t distribution. Because this quantity right here, often called a t statistic, has a t distribution. And it turns out that that t distribution has n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So we can do the same process we did on the previous slide. We can do uh, a thousand realizations. Actually, I think they're the same exact realizations, but now we've calculated this statistic. And we've overlaid on top of these histograms the t distribution with the appropriate degrees of freedom, uh, the number of samples minus 1. And again, we can see, although there is variability in the histogram, we can see that those samples generally follow the shape of the distribution that we can actually calculate, that t distribution, with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. All right, if we go and talk about the binomial model, and we look at the sample proportion, that is y divided by n, and we think about, well, what is the probability mass function for that ratio, right, here where y is random? Uh, and in particular, we know that that's a probability, right, because y ranges in value between 0 and n, and so it's going to be equal to some probability p, but we can very easily see that within these parentheses, we could just multiply both sides by n. And if we multiply both sides by n, then we just get the probability that y is equal to n times p. 
Now there is a question here about what are the possible values of p, but if you see, think about what are the values of y, then you can determine what the values of p are, that is, knowing the support of y will tell you the support of this ratio of y over n, and it turns out that that support are these ratios 0, 1 over n, 2 over n, 3 over n, so forth, all the way up to 1. Now, so we now have the sampling distribution of this sample proportion, and we can calculate it just by calculating the associated probability that the binomial random variable is equal to a particular value n times p, that is, that there are one successes and two successes and so forth. And so we can do the same process we did with the normal model, and we can randomly simulate binomials. In this case, again, I think there were a thousand. And now we have two different factors that are changing. We have the probability changing from 0.5 to 0.8 on the two columns, and we have the sample size ranging from 10 on the top to 100 on the bottom. Overlaid on top of the histograms of the proportion that fall into each of these bins, uh, we have the uh, probability mass function that's now been shifted to show the sample proportion rather than the number of successes to the interval 0, 1, and we show that overlaid on top of those histograms. And we can see again that there's a pretty good match between the two, and again if we took more binomial samples it would get closer and closer. Alright, now the last thing we're going to talk about is how you can construct approximate sampling distributions for means and or averages and sums. So as a reminder, we're going to use the central limit theorem here. The central limit theorem, there'll be a link up here to the central limit theorem, uh, and you should go back and check that side out or the video out if you haven't seen it before. But the central limit theorem basically tells us that uh, if we have a sum of a collection of random variables that are independent with a common mean and common variance, then that sum has an approximate, thus the tilde with a dot over, that dot indicating approximately distributed, that sum is approximately distributed as a normal distribution with a mean n times the mean of an individual random variable, and a variance that's equal to n times the variance of one of those individual random variables. We can use properties of normals very quickly to determine that the sample average, that is the sample sum divided by n, is also approximately normal with a mean that's the mean of one of the individual random variables and a variance that's the variance of one of those individual random variables divided by n. All right, so now let's try to apply this idea to a binomial random variable. As a reminder, binomial random variable is just the sum of independent Bernoulli random variables with a common probability of success here, in this case, it's p. So if you go uh, check out the link to a Bernoulli random variable if you're not familiar with that. All right, so now what we're going to do is, again, we're going to take that ratio of y over n. But y over n, since y is the sum of the x's, divided by n, we have an average. We can calculate from the results on the previous slide. We can calculate this is approximately normally distributed with a mean of p and a variance of p times 1 minus p divided by n. Just like we've done on all the sides, here we have uh, a realization of that sampling process in the histogram. And overlaid on top of that histogram is this normal PDF. Okay, We can see when the sample size is relatively small, when n is 10, right? the fit doesn't look great just because we have the discreteness on the case of the uh, Bernoulli proportion. Uh, but as the sample size increases, those kind of fill in, and they sort of better look like that probability density function. So this central limit theorem is a way to construct sampling distributions, at least approximately, any time you have sums and averages of independent random variables with a common mean and a common variance. All right, so in summary, uh, we talked here today about sampling distributions and the important ones that we want to keep in mind for later to construct confidence intervals and p-values uh, are sampling distributions for the normal, right, where we have the sample mean uh, has a normal. This was really just for a description. Uh, the more important one that we're going to use in the future is this t uh, statistic. We also talked about the binomial distribution, and in particular talking about the sample proportion, that is y over n. And we noted that we can actually derive the probability mass function for that proportion. But also, if it's of interest, we could use the central limit theorem to approximate that sample proportion. And we found that the uh, sample proportion is approximately normally distributed with a mean of p and a variance of p times 1 minus p divided by n. 
Um, but that result of the central limit theorem actually uh, we can use in many more scenarios. In particular, we can use it when the uh, anytime the xi's are these random variables are independent and they have a common mean and variance, and we're calculating a sum or an average of those random variables. That's when the central limit theorem tells us they are approximately normally distributed. In the next couple of slides, we'll start talking about non-Bayesian or frequentist ways of doing some inference, including confidence intervals and p-values. Hope to catch you there.